uh, Martin. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, hey, 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 everyone. Thanks for thanks for logging on. Um, I thought this was uh, quite a fun topic. Uh, it's probably, I mean, uh, putting in Egyptian is probably a little bit of a stretch, but it's certainly like the way that uh, the Egyptian style they they do play a very open style of play, and and that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, and if any of you have either been on previous uh, uh, previous seminars or webinars uh, about building pressure at low risk, this is kind of an extension of that. So that's um, so kind of a fun topic. Uh, so and like Jeff said, I'm happy to field questions. It's probably best that I take questions. I'll take them at the end, obviously, as well. But any any kind of clarification that you need, or any questions or challenges or anything you have, please feel you free to. Stop. And, uh, I'm not saying. So, just, just a reminder right. for those. Just a reminder right. for those signing on to mute their microphones. AirPods. I'm saying. Anyone just signing on? Can you guys mute your microphones for Martin, please? Sorry, Martin. Go ahead. Okay. So keep on going, Jeff. Go ahead. Uh, okay, Jesse. Yeah. Next slide. Oh, sorry. There you go. So, actually, I go back to the previous one. Sorry. Uh, so, I mean, essentially, this is. Uh, I mean, it's it's an attacking. It's very fluid. It's very active, uh, and it's it's kind of a, it is a counter-attacking strategy. Uh, strategy, but it's like an attack, then movement, anticipation, and then a counter-attacking strategy as as well. Uh, next slide. So, just to go over some basic uh, playing styles. Not that anyone plays exactly this you know each one style but it, it helps to be able to identify um backhand containment very similar to to what i'm talking about in terms of building pressure at low risk is just using the using strong position and side walls uh, to build pressure you start with length and then trying to trying to get in front of your opponent and you know when you attack try to have a, a pretty low risk attack like high pressure low risk using using the ball low the, uh, keeping the ball tight and always trying to maintain a dominant position uh, so very similar to what I've been talking about so far. Uh, lob drop is really where you're trying to play the ball in the corners. You're trying to take the middle out of the equation. Uh, high pressure attack, uh, hitting the ball low and hard, uh, creating space quickly, which is which is uh, I suppose the important part of this. And, and then really attacking very aggressively into space or into the neck. Uh, the moving game or the counter attack game. That's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, keeping your opponent moving, uh, you know, being, you know, having having a lot of awareness, playing into space, being able to attack, use anticipation, awareness, and uh, very quick foot speed to, to then jump onto the next ball and attack it. Uh, hit and run, which is, uh, you know, whenever it, it's a kind of passive strategy, it seems to work a lot of the time. When no, when an active strategy is not working, pretty much just run and getting the ball, and not letting it bounce twice, keeping the ball in between the lines, and, and just trying to. Sometimes that works. Uh, next slide. Uh, sorry for this small writing here. I figure this was uh, this is something that you can use as a reference. Um, so it just gives a little bit more, a little bit more information and uh, the types of players that use these. For example, I mean I, the way that I look at it, every player has to have backhand containment strategy. So as you're teaching your players, this is not the only style you want your players to have, but every player needs to have this strategy because what that does is it allows you to be able to compete. So a player that's got better movement, better racket skills, better you know pretty much better everything, uh, you can kind of neutralise their skills in some way if you have backhand containment. If you know how to keep the ball tight to the wall deep, uh, when you do attack, don't open it up. Don't uh, you know you keep the ball pretty tight. It nullifies a lot of uh, a better player's skills. So. So it's a good strategy to either have if you're clawing your way back or you just don't want to open the court up for your opponent. So that and that's why I I, I kind of put this as the, the building pressure at low risk. That's why that this is the first kind of the most important part of uh, of of trying to get a, a national program going is that everyone needs this. Every good player have this has this strategy. Whether they use it uh, a lot, they have they have to have it. A uh, lob drop. Uh, you can have another way of saying this, but you know, you look at the great players like uh, Ali Farag actually uses this. Uh, Jan Shokan used this. Nick Matthew uses this. It's really where they're using the. Uh, you're taking the middle out of the equation completely. You're not hitting the ball through the court too much, uh, unless it's straight. When you go cross court, pretty much everything is high cross court, um, and you're really trying to keep the ball in the corners, taking the middle out of the equation. 
Um, high pressure attack. Uh, you see this with uh, Rod Martin was probably one of the best players at this. Shorbagi uses this. Uh, Shabana was very good at this. Rami in some way. Uh, you see Shorbini, the, uh, Naran Gohar, uh, Renimal Walaili, Abu Elgar uses this. Is really where you're you're trying to create, you're hitting the ball through the court using pace, pressure, uh, trying to you know create, trying to hit hit into space very very quickly. And uh, you know you're not trying to build your rally slowly. You're really trying to uh, create space very quickly and attack into that space. Um, and the moving game, which is the you know the Egyptian open style, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, it's really defined by attacking and then counter attacking. Uh, a lot of the time, it's, I suppose specifically from three quarter court, anything whether you're playing off your back foot or you have time at three quarter court, you're using that you're using that shot to attack. Whether that's a boast, whether it's a half kill, a fade, a drop, uh, you're pretty much any kind of loose shot from there. You're going to attack that shot. Um, and we'll talk obviously a little bit more about that. Um, and then using using quick foot speed anticipation, and then there's very dynamic movement to then uh, get onto the next shot and and uh, be very aggressive. Uh, so that's also used. But I would say if you're going to look for players that that use this very well, Gawad uses this so well. His boast is unbelievable, and then his quick foot speed, and then his his skills when he gets onto the ball. Tarek Momum, obviously, like his movement is unbelievable. Uh, in terms of the the females, uh, Rinyamal Walaili and Nuriel Tayeb, they use this strategy a little bit. Uh, it tends to be a little bit more of a male strategy, I would say, at risk of sounding reasonably sexist. Is that it's the, just because movement is such a, a massive uh, part of this strategy. Uh, so when you've got young players that they want to boast all the time and they want to have, they want to play this kind of style because it's fun, uh, they really have to have the movement to be able to cover and then counter attack the next shot. Uh, so you tend to see, you know, very very good players uh, like Raneem and, and Noor. I mean, they can use this strategy because their movement and anticipation and racket skills are incredible. So they they can kind of get away with this. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just a quick definition. So like we said, attacking short at the first opportunity, especially from the quarter court, uh, the dynamic movement forward, uh, you know, this kind of this strategy of attack, dynamic movement, counter attack. Uh, and also when the ball sits up, you're not you're not going to play a boast. You're going to put the ball away. Uh, you're always busy. You're never really letting letting your opponent settle. Uh, and because it, you're because you're opening the court up a little bit, you need to you can't be too structured, you can't be too tight with your movement. It's, it helps to be very loose and languid, and that's something that many of the Egyptian players have. Uh, just this incredibly loose movement allows them to to be able to improvise and and to to change directions and and uh, and come up with some great shots under unusual circumstances. Uh, and also a big part of it is to treat strokes as the reward for good play. Uh, so when you've got your opponent under under pressure at the front and they and they kind of, they don't clear the ball, you know it's you're entitled to be able to you know take that path to the ball that you want and and pick up a stroke. It's not it's not seen as unsportsmanlike. It's seen as just part of the game. Uh, next slide. Next slide, Jeff. So uh, again, so the skills needed. Um, so the again, this is kind of a little bit repetitive. Uh, so the, the the ability to be able to attack the front court, but from the court to court, you need the the, the lightning foot speed mastery. Uh, so even though, though you're moving into the front court very very quickly, you still have to be have to uh, have some control. If you look at somebody, he gets so unbelievably low to the ball. He's really stretching out in in front, uh, and then he's and his counter attack is incredible. Incredible is probably the best counter counter drop is probably the best in the game because of that movement. He's so controlled and so balanced, uh, and the ability to be able to essentially what we're talking about with someone like Momum, uh, I would say someone like Gawad. He has he's a little bit higher on the ball than Momum, but his his racket skills are incredible, and so he's able to go in very very quickly and then. And then even with a fairly high swing and be able to cut underneath the ball and still keep that ball short, whether it's a trickle boast, whether it's a drop, a fade cross, uh, he's able to keep that ball short. Uh, and so that's, I mean, that's a huge thing. I mean, you know, you tend to find that a lot of the juniors that they'll co that you'll coach, if they go in, they're too high, the racket is too high. I mean, they're pretty much going to hit cross court, like a hard cross court drive. Um, the other part of this strategy is that you've got to have a high strength to weight ratio. I mean, you've got to be light and you've got to be strong. You've got to be quick. If you don't have that, it's probably not the right strategy. 
Um, so if you can't cover with your movement, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely better to, to play a bit smarter. Uh, next slide. Next slide, Jeff. Should be good, Mark. So in terms of mindset, um, so in terms of mindset, um, you know, you're still looking to dominate with length. You know, this is uh, so just because you're, uh, you know, you're playing this all court game, uh, you're attacking through from the quarter court, you're counter attacking at the front. Uh, you're still, you still have to dominate with the length. It's not you're, you're still trying to get in front of your opponent. You're trying to put your opponent under pressure, get them off balance. Um, and then when you when you get a loose shot, when you get that first opportunity, that's what, you're not going to wait. You're not going to hold too much and put it to length. You're going to you're going to put it in at, at the first opportunity. Uh, you're always looking to push forward. Uh, when you are moving forward from the tee to the front, there is that kind of urgency, that very very quick foot speed, and that in, t in terms of your mindset, you're you're really looking for that urgency forward. So as soon as you, as soon as that ball goes forward, then the, you know just kind of the red, the, the alarm goes off, the, the red light starts flashing. That's when you know anything can happen. You you know you can win or lose the point very very quickly at that point. So you want to be very urgent, very aware, yeah, but still calm and controlled at the same time. Uh, you're always looking to confuse your opponent. Uh, you're always looking to 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 be deceptive, get your opponent a little bit off balance. Uh, show one shot and quickly play the other, or unless you know, unless it makes sense, just to play like a simple drop shot. Uh, using the side walls to change the angle, obviously with a boast from the court to court. You see the, you see occasionally the the boast to off the volley. It's not, you know, it's it's not used. It's maybe used on the glass court a little bit. It's probably I don't think it's a great shot. Other than that, uh, mostly from the court to court, and then a triple boast to the front. Um, obviously, the stroke taking the strokes is part of the game. Um, you know, and then, like we said, you got to keep. You got to be very relaxed. Uh, you can't be too uptight. Even though you are, you know, you, there's a sense of urgency when the ball goes short. You still need to be very calm and be able to to cope with like whatever comes with unexpected shots. Next, next slide, Jeff. So in terms, of, so the next couple of slides, I've given some some uh, techniques and then some practices to to go through this. Um, so a lot of it, like I said, a lot of it is this count, count is an attack from the court to court, you know, then a bit of urgency, very quick foot speed, and then the ability to be able to to uh, to to do something creative and deadly at the front of the court. Uh, so in terms of uh, in terms of your movement, um, let's have a look here. So when you when you move forward, uh, so when you hit your when you hit your shot, rather than sprint forwards, when you hit, let's say you're going to hit a boast uh, from the court to court, uh, you want to be able to to move quickly forward, but you still want to have the ability to be able to split step and move back or move to the side uh, if if that's where the ball comes. So but so what happens if you move if you move forward too quickly, it's going to be difficult to uh, you know split step and adjust. So you want to be quick, and then what you can do is you can build on that momentum. So when the ball does stay short, then you can just you can use that momentum to then increase your foot speed and then just and be very aggressive uh, forward, uh, but not not so quick to the tee that you're you know you you're static on the tee or you're you can you're going so quick that you can turn and you can volley or you can you can do a split step and move back. So getting that right like uh, the right kind of pace of uh, of moving from from the you know through court to court to the tee. That's quite an important. Uh, it's quite an important movement, and you see again. You see a lot if you look at Janjo, you look at Dawad. You see the way that they these uh, these players they when they hit the ball, they're not sprinting forward. They're kind of walking fast almost, and that allows them to be able to build the momentum or check and and play something else. Um, so when you move into the front of the court, uh, getting the ball, get, getting as low as possible and keeping your body as far away from the, from the corner as you can. And again, you know, we're using Tarek Momim as a, as, a, as a good example. It's a, he's just unbelievably low. He's really, he's as far back, he's almost in the middle of his back foot, it's almost in the middle of the court when, when he's reaching forward into the front court. Uh, and that's a good example for your opponent. Therefore, your for the kids that you're teaching, it's just they want to be low. If they're high, if their feet are too close together, if the racket is too high, it's going to be very difficult for them to be able to keep the ball in the corner. Or if they do head out, they get a chance of giving away a stroke or just being out of position. So as low as possible to the ball. Um, so when you are hitting from the quarter court, um, you know, playing off the back foot. Um, 
using using that kind of using this slow slow quick technique again if if any if any any of any coaches have been on previous uh, webinars that uh, talk a bit about this a uh, instead of instead of accelerating too early from a high swing or instead of just blocking the ball uh, having some momentum with your swing before and that what that does is that allow, allows you to uh, to get the rack ahead very close to the ball so you get control uh, without accelerating too quickly uh, but then it allows you the momentum similar with the movement the momentum allows you to be able to then accelerate through the hitting zone to play then the drive boast half kill drop shot uh, whatever shot you want to play uh, so it's quite an important technique you see that you see that uh, again all top players have this have this kind of style um, you know this early preparation again it has to be early if you're going to come down slow and through slow uh, you have to have early preparation uh, but then this quick acceleration uh, which is key to be able to change the direction of the ball and being deceptive. Um, so from the front of the court, uh, when you're lunging in low, uh, it helps to be able to um, to be able to reach forward, just get that racket low and reach forward in front of you. Uh, but but it's it's kind of and uh, you know you want to have again enough movement in the racket here to be able to vary vary that shot as well. But again, if you do go in, you do go in very low, and the racket is in front of you, you still have the control to play this perfect counter drop. Um, so another thing that's kind of uh, fun, you see Shobagi use this on the on the forehand side. You see you see Gawad use this on the backhand side. Is where you're lunging in with quite a high racket with an open racket face, but then you, the, you're accelerating from a high swing, but you open. It's almost like a Phil Mickelson kind of uh, chip shot. You're getting the racket head right underneath the ball, and you're you're still accelerating, cutting underneath, and that allows you to. So you because you're accelerating, it looks almost like a drive. Uh, but the ball stays short. Uh, so this is, the, and then you know you can play a triple post, or you can you can play almost any shot from this technique, but allows you to to play the ball short. Um, so there are a couple of little techniques that are, uh, about this, but not moving the elbow. If you look at Shurbagi, his his elbow moves, but his his uh, racket head actually doesn't get that far from the ball. Uh, so it still stays. So your racket head is not incredibly far from the ball when you're preparing for this. It's actually still quite close to it, but the elbow moves a lot. Uh, so what Jonathan was very good at this on the backhand side, Jonathan Power. Um, but it's a fun, it's a fun thing to practice. It's, again, it's one of these things is that as you're building with building this kind of very basic structure with your with your pupils, it's one of these kind of fun shots to practice that makes it interesting. Uh, next slide, Jeff. So just a couple of ideas about some practices to to go through this. Uh, so both drive with just increasing options. So you can you can just add options to both drive. So uh, which allows the so a couple of shots uh, just so you're practicing different techniques. Um, so the similar kind of technique that I was talking about in terms of either blocking the you know staying away and blocking the drop shot or you know coming in a little bit higher, a little bit higher racket and really cutting cutting into that ball, cutting underneath the ball to, to keep it short. Um, from the front, adding the straighter across, uh, so that gives the the person at the back of the court the ability to be able to, you know, then well or try to anticipate it, and then from that to court or court area, playing that drop shot, half kill, boast, fake cross, uh, or or just a drop or a boast if that's if it's just two shot options. Uh, but building on the boast arrive, obviously, as I'm sure you all do. Uh, same with the alley game, just just the. Um, with, a, with a, a boast or a fade to change the side, so you're all up and up and down one of one of the alleys, and then you can change with the with the fade of the boast. Uh, with so similar kind of feel again, everything's going to be from to quarter court, kind of back of the you know taking the ball before the back wall or or back of the service box area. Uh, the front back game is very difficult. It's a you kind of start with a boast as a serve, and um, and then you can from the back of the court you've essentially got all the options that you would play from or from the court to court rather you have all the options that you that a, let's say a, a great Egyptian player would play, uh, the the boast to drop the half kill the fade, uh, and and again also looking to as soon as you play it you're moving getting that fast walk forward looking for looking for the volley in this case, uh, and then also with a deep game in, with increasing options so you add. Add a boast uh, with a, with a couple of counters, so it's a, it would be a full game. As soon as they go short, it would be a full game, uh, and you can just add as boast, drop, fade, cross, drop as you're uh, with as you keep on going. 
Uh, it's a very simple practices that I'm sure you all do, but it's uh, I find these uh, bow drive alley game front back deep game with uh, you know and then add in options. So it's just a very simple ways of of uh, practicing these skills. Uh, next slide, Jeff. So pretty pretty simple, uh, not a huge amount of content there, but it's uh, but in terms of you know just to summarise, it's really about. Uh, when the ball when the ball is into the quarter court area when you're when you're playing off your back foot uh, or you have some time about through quarter court then you're you're thinking all the time you're thinking attack you're not just thinking about the um you know just thinking about heading to length and getting in front and then using the volley it's like you're trying to attack the into with a boss with a drop with a fade uh, with a half kill and then moving forward looking for that next shot um, so it's it's kind of it's the you know and that's and that is the same when you look when you look at Sherbini, you look at Ranim, you look at uh, you know all of the the great female players, the great Egyptian female players. I mean, all of them pretty much exclusively are are attacking from the quarter court. It's very rare uh, that they're going to you know take, have that shot and not take it on. Uh, so I think that's one of the first things is this the through quarter court is an attackable area. Um, the boast tends to be the the shot that can that can, is is very useful from that area. Uh, when you're reaching back, I mean a lot of the time uh, from the quarter court you're reaching back and you're kind of playing you're you're playing the ball off your back foot, whatever foot that would be. You're playing with the ball off your back foot. What tends to happen? Let's say on the backhand side, what tends to happen is that. Uh, a player, the, the, the player will naturally anticipate that uh, that their opponent is going to hit straight. They're going to kind of lift the ball a little bit on the backhand side, play straight, then get in front. And so they naturally move over, maybe even slightly back, to try to volley that ball uh, or to anticipate going to the back of the court. Uh, and when you chuck in the boast from the from off the back foot, that's quite a deceptive shot. So it's a little bit risky, but it's it's a very effective shot. Again, if you're catching your opponent unaware. And then that quick walk forward, looking to then, you know, just jump on the next shot, whether that's going to be stroke, whether it's jumping on and putting in the drop shot, uh, or be or playing a very aggressive shot one way or another. That's that's really what you're trying to do. It's like gambit, anticipation, movement, and aggressive shot. That's what defines that kind of style. And it's um, yeah, it's I mean it's fun. It's it's a fun style to play. If you move well and you can anticipate and you you can read the game well. Uh, and you have a good sense of uh, you can improvise well. Um, a big, a big thing. I'm going to go over this tomorrow actually with uh, some of the juniors, just about a uh, wrist work. Uh, I didn't put it in this one here, but that's actually quite a, quite an important part of this. Is that when you reach forward, uh, when you're going forward, the the ability to be able to change the direction of the ball, you do need a little bit of uh, wrist strength and the ability to, be, ability to be able to change the direction of the ball. Now, whether that's through cutting under the ball, as we talked about, or or kind of uh, snapping the ball, um, you know, or just playing this very, very basic kind of uh, stun uh, counter drop, uh, you do need a bit of wrist strength and stability to be able to play these shots. Uh, so I can I can forward on, or Jeff can forward on the, the slide for tomorrow to you as well, uh, which might be useful, because uh, I don't think the coaches are going to be on that one. I think it's just the, the players. Uh, but that's uh, yeah. I mean, that's my version of of what it takes to to play this kind of style of game. And so I'll take any questions. Great, thank you, Martin. Uh, uh, yeah, we uh, would like to open the floor to uh, any questions for those of you that have questions. Just uh, uh, unmute your microphone and uh, and ask away. Martin, I have two. Sure. Okay, when you talk about the back leg, you're talking about the leg that would be closest to the back wall or the one closest to the middle? No, the one closest to the back wall. The closest to the back wall. Okay, now, um, the next question, when you play a shot at three quarters, is it important that you be standing on your back leg first before you try to hit that shot to be balanced and the margin for error on the front wall? So, okay, two good questions. Well, I mean, a lot of the time you're not going to have the ability to be able to, you know, the ball's not always going to set up. It's going to be, a, let's say, if, it, if the ball sets up as a quarter court, then it's a bad shot. It's a bad length from your opponent, right? So then you can get two feet planted, uh, you know, with it balanced on both feet. And then, and then you can, at that point, I would say you can, your margin of error, 
you know you're always giving yourself a margin of error but it's but you can go lower at that point because you're very you're very balanced you can hit the ball in the you know the perfect position between your feet and with your technique and i would say at that point you know you get you know a lot of the players like galad or shabini uh, ranim um james james wilstrop i mean all of these they're going for the winner they're going for the outright winner from that shot when they have a little bit of time uh, when when they don't have too much time, it's just like a regular kind of eighty percent pressure length, uh, but you're going to take it before the back wall. Uh, you're you know a lot of the time when you're going short, when you're playing the drop shot, you're going for width. You know it's more it's almost more of a half kill rather than drop shot. You're going for width and lowness, or you're pushing in the in the box, uh, which is kind of just to catch your opponent unaware. Like as I said, they're trying to anticipate the the you know you chipping the ball. You're playing off the back foot, you're chipping the ball high straight to move forward. They're anticipating that, you're pushing the ball, it's a deceptive shot. So again, it's all margin of error. Uh, if you have more time, you have less uh, you know, you have less margin. If you don't have too much time, you go for width or or the change of direction with the ball. Uh, Martin, I have uh, a question in the chat, uh, one from Sean O and then a question from Andrew Lynn. So I'll start with Sean O's question. Uh, he says, sure. what do you think the biggest difference is between traditional English style and Egyptian game style? If you can name three three differences. Well, I mean, one is the the English style is is to I mean you're building your rally straight you're building your rally deep and straight and and it's, and even on the volley I mean again this is like building pressure with uh you know high pressure low risk I mean this is really this is really what I, what I'm I'm trying to communicate as the kind of first piece of the puzzle and that's really the English style I mean that's pretty much what they do what they what those guys miss out on I would say is that kind of open style where they're using this kind of a little bit is a little bit more chaos. Uh, where you, you know you need a few more skills, you need to be able to improvise a little bit more. Uh, so someone like a let's say a Declan James, who's kind of he's gotten a lot better over the last couple of years by playing this very strict length, length, length. Get in front. You put in the half kill. You got the drop or the lob when you go into the front. You know, there's really you're playing the percentages uh, a lot of the time, and it's pretty much I suppose it's like how the English play most sports is that you play the percentages all the time. Uh, so and it's pressure. You're using pressure with length, pressure with position, pressure with width, uh, keeping the ball low. Uh, you're not really exposing yourself to any kind of chaos. So if Declan James, you know, play just by virtue of his is the type of athlete he is, you know, with very high hips, let's say, it's going to be difficult for him to change direction very quickly at the front of the court. So it's probably not a smart uh, play for him anyway. Um, so I would say the you know build, building your rally, you know, how how you build pressure. They build it very sequentially. They, they you're building, uh, you're building with, uh, you know, with the width, with good position. Uh, so that it's not that the Egyptian players don't do this, or this open style doesn't do this. But when they have an opportunity, then they're attacking, or they inject just that, inject the boast in. Uh, and there's a lot that can happen from the boast. So, so, you, so there's, you know, they are. I would, I would say that there's a bit more chaos in the Egyptian style. Uh, they need to be a little bit more relaxed because of that. Uh, probably quicker foot speed, quicker anticipation, uh, but also the, this concept of of uh, how creating space quickly or not. So I would say the traditional English style creates space slowly. I mean, it's over a period of time. It's a small advantage is accumulated over from back to front, you know, and eventually you get the volley onto your forehand side, and boom, you're you're trying to hit a nine length, and you're being aggressive with one shot. Uh, rather than being aggressive with four or five or three shots in in the in the rally, and uh, I would say that the Egyptian style creates space kind of you know reasonably quickly, and then this high pressure attack creates space very quickly. I mean, you're pretty much hitting the ball hard into you know down length, uh, into the middle of the court, and then into the neck. I mean, that's really what you're trying to do. So, so this concept of creating how quickly you create space, I think that's that's a big difference between this. Uh, you know, a lot of these different kind of styles, you know, maybe the English, Egyptian, Australian, typically, typical kind of styles, if that makes sense. Great. Uh, next question is from Andrew Lynn. Do you recommend the boast when played as an offensive shot uh, is played softly with quite uh, a lot of underspin, or would you suggest more of a medium paced shot? Uh, I'm assuming two wall boast with ball dying at far side wall. 
So, I mean, it depends upon the situation. I don't, I don't like the boast. Again, it really depends on, you know, the, you know, under 12, the boast is probably the best shot uh, there is. Um, you know, as you get better, the boast is might be the, the, maybe one of the worst shots that you can play. It's just overplayed at a certain point. Uh, there's no pressure, you know, you're, the players are not pulling their, their opponents back far enough. There's no deception. They're just playing at the wrong time. So I would say, I don't. I, I don't think it's a great shot from the back wall. I think it's a great shot from before the back wall, from the court to court, because again, your opponent's anticipating, looking to volley the ball or going back, and then chucking in that working post at that point uh, is a great shot. Uh, I would say that that's played more as you know the typical way you teach a boast, which is kind of open racket face cut. You hit higher in the side wall, so when it reaches the front wall, uh, the pace is taken off it, and then it dies towards the side wall. So from the quarter court, I would say that the the work in boast uh, reasonably I wouldn't say soft. I mean, still you still have to accelerate the racket head, but because of the cut and the fact that the angle of the of the shot, uh, you know, is, is probably a medium pace shot uh, from the back wall. Um, when you have, I would say that's an, if you're going to play a boast, that's aggressive. It has to be aggressive because your opponent at that point is. Uh, is not really they're you know they're they're not anticipating the volley. I would say. Uh, so that so anything is possible. So if you so if you boast from that point, your opponent can just run onto very very quickly and then counter drop, and then you're completely out of position. So I would say from the back off the back wall, I would say this uh, the the three wall boast is a great shot because uh, because the technique is the same as hitting the low hard down length uh, as it is to hit a, a a three wall boast. So you can be very aggressive and you can have two different opposite corners that you're playing very very quickly into. Uh, so I think that's maybe a good distinction to make. Off the back wall, hit hard. Off before the back wall, hit more medium pace. Okay, next uh, next question is from Kiel Gattinger, and I apologize if I didn't say that properly. Uh, his question is, how would you rank this style relative to others for being able to exploit a movement advantage versus your opponent? And if you just wanted to insert it into games from time to time for a handful of points, is there a more natural phase of a game? Uh, he says, I'm guessing later when fatigue would allow movement exploitation. Uh, and then great webinar and thanks. Okay, well, I think, are you, Jeff, you're going to kill me here. I'm going to ask you to repeat the question. There's a lot There's a lot in there. <laughs> can, you, can you repeat that, please? Sure. So how would you rank this style relative to others for being able to exploit a movement advantage versus your appointment? Uh, so basically, when uh, when would you insert this into games? Uh, use it for you know time to time for a handful of points, or is there a more natural time in the game uh, to use it? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I mean, is it? Can you take advantage of a movement weakness with a boast? Of course you can. I mean, that's that's. Uh, I would say it's more prevalent at junior level. Uh, it's more prevalent. I would say in the female game. Uh, I would say, and and it's prevalent with the, the top Egyptian players that have unbelievable top Egyptian male players that have unbelievably uh, you know unbelievable set of skills. This kind of set of skills that I really like to point out in the PowerPoint, which is the you know anticipation, the quick foot speed, the, the languid, relaxed movement, and then the ability to be able to keep the ball short from even when they're moving in very very quickly uh, with whatever technique, whether it's cutting underneath the ball. So. Um, so you know you tend to find that that uh, the boast is is used, yeah, of course, to to exploit movement or as this kind of gambit plus like attack and gambit plus this uh, counter attack and expectation. Um, so I would I would say, um, what was the second part of the question? Uh, kind of a natural phase of the game as to when you would uh, you know use use this yeah. style. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there is that. So again, if you're if you're if you're playing the traditional kind of uh, traditional style of play, I mean, really the the rhythm of the game would be establish length, try and get in front of your opponent. You're looking for you know just to to kind of freeze your opponent out a little bit and, and establish you know who's who's the top dog in terms of length. Uh, you know, as your opponent starts to 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 uh, you know as their heart rate gets up and as they're as they're working really hard and they're giving you some loose shots. Uh, as they set their teeth further back as well, because that's essentially what you're trying to do with with consistent good length. Is it's not it's not just one shot, get the volley and put it in. It's like you're you're trying to get them to set their teeth further back. So the the recovery position that gets further and further and further back. So when they do that, then you can put in the boast. 
So that probably happens usually, I would say, sometime, you know, halfway through the second game, let's say, uh, when someone gets a little bit frustrated, a little bit tired, you know, and then they set their teeth further back, then the boast is a very useful shot. Um, or, you know, just, and you know, you have to be, I would say, from my own experience, so some players just have a, they have a good sense of that. They have a good sense of when, you know, you just, you, you just get a little bit lazy. You, you know, you're expecting the length is good and you're expecting the length. You don't quite get, and then boom, you don't quite get to the tee and then boom, the post comes in and it's, uh, so yeah, I would say probably second, third games when you start kind of, you know, pushing that in. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the Egyptian style, where I don't think there is, I think the rhythm is just, okay, what well, you're going to put it in just, just whenever. I think it's just, you're so confident, you know, in your own movement and your own skill set is that you can use it you can use it in the first game. You can use it any 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 time. Uh, what I tell so players that I coach, I tell them to stay away from the boast on big points uh, because there is a, it's a moving shot. You're expecting your opponent to get it. Uh, you know you might see some uh, some uh, top players on sports TV play the the boast a boast winner in big points uh, with the white ball and the low tin. It does make a big difference uh, when you play that shot. But if you're playing 17 inch tin in a regular court. Uh, I would say the straight volley drop and the boast are actually probably not great great shots to play on big points uh, because these are these are shots where your opponent's probably going to get it uh, and and it's like and you go and because of the pressure of the situation you go lower and lower and lower and you tend to make a lot of mistakes or I've seen over over the years that players make a lot of mistakes on on these shots. Uh, so I'd be better to be more aggressive deep, and then when you do go short, be a little bit more aggressive uh, with the cross neck or the fade or the, or the kill. Uh, so that's that's what I would say in terms of uh, the rhythm of the game. Okay, uh, next question is from Mahmoud. His question is, how to figure out which style to play with when you're playing someone you haven't played before? Okay. I mean, you you have to. Do, I mean, you probably learn a little bit just from from watching them in the warm up. I mean, you you can see whether they, you know, if they if they're playing off the off their front foot, the front of the court, they're too high. Uh, you know, they're you know, you can pick up a lot of information in terms of uh, you know where what their what their movement is. I I like thinking about someone's movement as the as the you know a certain point. I suppose when you're from when you're coaching juniors, there are technical deficiencies. You can take some advantage of. A technical technical deficiency in some way. Um, as you as the, the players get a little bit better, then there's not many technical deficiencies. Most of the players have most of the shots from most of the areas. Uh, so you're looking at exploiting movement at that point. And so I think that's probably what you try and do. Um, and so I think you have to try. I mean, you have to. I mean, you, if you just play length, length, length all day, you're never going to find out how they move in at the front of the court and and you know what they're you know, how quick their feet are, how, you know, whether they volley or not. So you still have to try. I mean, that's really, you pick up as much information as you can uh, early on with no risk, whether it's in warm up. And then you try. I mean, you just, you, 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 you kind of try out, you're, you test your opponent. That's really what you're trying to do. If you're not too sure what their, what their game is, if you go in without, a, you know, playing an opponent you haven't seen before, you have to test out a little bit. And you're trying to pick up information that you can use later on. Uh, so yeah, I mean you you push in the boast every now and again. You see how they move. You see how they recover. Uh, you know, and the same when you know do they do they anticipate the volley very quickly? So it's like any other game. You're trying to pick up information that you can use. I don't know whether that answers the question, but okay. Uh, next question, Martin comes from Kiefer Wait, uh, asking what is the best way to counter a player who's playing this Egyptian style. So, I mean, the if someone boasts if someone boasts you up, I mean, you're really what you're. I would say again, this harkens back to to what I'm trying to get through is that you're. I mean, if someone boasts you, let's say forehand boast into the front backhand, uh, then you're you're trying to get in in there for for the drop shot. I mean, that's what you're trying to do. If someone's hitting from the quarter court or at the back of the court, you're trying to get in for the drop shot as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, if they're onto that, you know, and, and it's one of the, I mean, it's an opportunity. A boast is not, you don't necessarily get in there and just play a lob from there. You're trying to get in there, very aggressive movement and uh, very low, stay away from the ball, rack it low and out in front of you. And then you're trying to play this drop shot tight to the wall, uh, hitting the floorboards first, staying tight. And then if they do get it, they probably can't go straight. They're probably going to go cross court and then you can follow the next shot. 
so that's the, I mean, that's the first thing you're trying to do off of Boston and, uh, and really, and you know, if you've, I mean, that's one of the, the start, that's one of the kind of um, antidotes to an Egyptian player, a great Egyptian player is that you're just keeping everything tight. You're closing the game down. Uh, I can remember a, a match I had against Kareem Darwish many years ago and he was, and I was, I was very good at the open style of play. My movement was very good. I had a good reaction time and things like this. And I was playing that style against him and I was losing. I was losing and, uh, and I was like, well, okay, that's, and he was a very talented player. And then I just closed everything down. I just, you know, when he hit a ball, hit a straight drop shot. When he hit a cross court, hit a straight kill or a straight drive. And you're pretty much making him play off the, off the walls all the time. And he just completely dysfunctioned. He just didn't know what to do unless he was just being languid and open and, and you know, and having, having space and time to hit the ball. And so, um, so, yeah, I mean, you're just trying to keep the ball tight to the wall at all times. Uh, and especially for my boast is that, I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're playing bad length and someone's attacking from two quarter court, it's, the, it's, it's, the tough, it's, tough to, it's tough to play against that. It's tough to have a, a, an antidote against that. That's just bad length. It's just that you have to adjust your length at that point. Uh, and you will have to adjust. You know, if, you're, if the ball's sitting up, then, then you need to find a way of either getting the ball deeper or harder through the court or lower through the court. Uh, something where there's not that time for the, your opponent to attack. Uh, but it is, the, I mean, that's the big feature of this style is the ability to attack uh, from, from the quarter court. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's, there's not really much of an antidote against that other, other than the fact that uh, you just hit better length. Okay, uh, next question, Martin, is from uh, Giselle Delgado. Uh, she asks, what are some things you would get players to work on to get better at this style without access to a court? Oof, put me in the spot here without access to a court. I mean, I think that, I mean, imagery. Um, and so going through, going through uh, a, what I would, well, I would say watching, watching the, the, the top players or your favorite players uh, that, or that have this kind of ability, a, a male or female, I, I think that you can, you can find players that have this style. Uh, so I would say, first of all, watching, watching those players uh, and there's plenty, there's plenty of stuff on squash TV or YouTube where you can see the players that you know just just attacking from the quarter court. I mean, that's you're not defending all the time. You're not just getting back and hitting straight length. Uh, you're the, these players are attacking like a lot of the time from there. So I would say that's the first thing. Uh, and then I think in terms of once you see it, then you can you know, go through some imagery in your in your own in your own game as well and think about how how are you going to do this and and. Uh, and then the other the other thing would be you know when this you know realizing that when you know you're not just moving around the court in the set at the same pace all the time you know when you when you reach the tee and when when the ball goes into the front of the court it's game on at that point this is like it's it's more intense they are 20 to 30 percent more just sharper quicker with your feet just getting getting everything ready um so i think that you know and what you can do from off court is to just yeah, identify and then kind of have some imagery with uh, with these things. And in terms of training, oh, it's difficult. It's di in terms of training, you probably I would say you can. Pra I mean, in a car park, in a I mean, you can definitely practice this uh, this style of movement where you're or this technique where you have some momentum, but you can check and go back. But when you have this momentum towards the team, then you can just very quickly increase that twenty thirty percent of pace. Uh, when you go forward, so whether that's cones, whether like whatever that would be, getting into that rhythm of movement where you're okay, you're playing the shot, you're walking quickly, and then and then either checking or or, or really applying the applying the speed at that point. Uh, so that's you know, that rhythm of movement is important. You don't want to move around the core at you know a uniform pace. Um, you know, I would probably take need a bit of time to be able to consider that, Giselle. I would say I'd probably need time to to think about what else you can do to practice this specifically. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do from when no, you know, not being on a squash course. I would say these are a couple of things. You can you can feel free to email me if you want more ideas, and I'll have a think about it. Okay. Uh, next question, Martin, comes from uh, Sebastian Michaud. Uh, he asks, I noticed the Egyptian players seem to be very good at improvising. Uh, always hitting the right spot, even when they're off balance. Are there any exercises you can do to get better at that? Yes, uh, I would say increasing increasing wrist uh, wrist and forearm strength. Uh, so, however you would do that, I mean grip, you know, hand grips. So you can get from Amazon. You can, or if you have dumbbells, you can do like dumbbell rolls. 
uh, you know, any any kind of any kind of exercise that would increase wrist strength. Now, the reason that that's important is that uh, whether the whether the ball is really far in front of you, all the way through to behind you, uh, or off your back foot, you have the ability to be able to uh, get the racket head very close to the ball and uh, and then to improvise from there. You can adjust the racket head very very easily when your wrist and your forearm are very strong. Uh, so I would say that's that's the first thing that you can do. Um, so what, what was the full question, Jeff? Uh, basically, any uh, exercises uh, that you can do to get better at, uh, uh, you know, the fact that the Egyptians are uh, improvising. Okay, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, so a lot of that, so if you want to practice this, and so that's the first thing, I would say wrist strength, forearm strength, that's the first thing. A, you know, in terms of timing of the swing, I mean, you can practice a swing again, and again, you can go into your garden or, or go into like any kind of spare space and, and do this, or in your house or apartment. But just getting that rhythm of the swing, this kind of early preparation, but then slow down, slow through, and then accelerate uh, just through the hitting zone. So getting the rack ahead as close to the ball or to this hitting zone as you possibly can before this acceleration. Uh, I would say that that rhythm again. If you're talking about the difference in the rhythm of the movement, not making it just a uniform pace all over the court. It's the same with the swing. It's just this slow, slow, and then this snap at the end of the end of the shot. Uh, and that and that's something that again a, a lot of the player, a lot of the, all the top players use. I mean, that's it's just it's an important technique to have. And it's that is I mean, if you, again, it's very similar. If you look at great golf uh, you know, golfers, for example, I mean, they're loading up and they're getting their body, they're getting everything. You know, very close to the ball. There's still momentum coming from the, you know, the big torque coming from the big muscles. Uh, but they're before they're not going to break their wrist until very, until very, very close to the ball. Uh, but then they do break their wrist and they just to, just to get the power through the shot. Uh, but they're not, they're not doing it. They're, they're not starting that process right for, you know, above their head. They're starting that process three inches from the ball. Uh, so I would say that's something that uh, to practice. Um, uh, that you can do in the in in your home, um, in terms of cutting underneath the ball, I mean that I would say that's a fun thing to practice. I mean you can practice that with a a table tennis ball, you know, just cutting underneath it, getting the ball spinning back to you, uh, just getting used to that kind of feeling of of uh, you know you're not just hitting the back of the ball all the time, you're manipulating the ball, uh, and in different with different spins. Uh, and so being able to to cut underneath the ball with acceleration is actually is is a is is kind of a, that allows a, a massive amount of uh, um, improvisational ability, uh, improvisational improvisational skill. Is that is when you can cut underneath, so you can run in even with a high racket, and you can still cut underneath the ball and keep that ball short. So I think that's the, again, there's a few ideas uh, that, that kind of correspond to the skills of improvising. And again, I probably need to think a little bit more about what you can do off, you know, at this time. But I think those are, those are some pretty good ideas. Great. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, final call for questions. Anyone else have any other questions? A uh, question just coming in from Matt Easingwood. Uh, thanks, Matt. Would you say that Jonathan helped build the Egyptian game? I assume you mean Jonathan Power, Matt? Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would say that Jonathan didn't use the boss too much. Jonathan would actually build, I mean, he was one of the best, I would say the, the, the half kill is one of the best shots, especially in the backhand side. That was one of his best shots. So from the quarter court, uh, he would play this half kill, and then he would move forwards. Uh, so you're, so you're, uh, you know, you're you're going down to the ball, and you're and you're, you know, the ball's low, it's tight to the wall, and you know you're you're right there. If you don't play this perfect uh, counter drop, uh, then he's right onto you getting the stroke. Or if if you do play a drop and it's not perfect, then he's onto you, you know, just playing that, you know, playing a deadly shot or snapping the ball to a different area of the court. Uh, so that, I would say that would, that was his gambit from the quarter court. Um, the open kind of Egyptian style, um, you know, there's, you know, really uses the boast a lot. So I would I would say that's not something that Jonathan used very much. Uh, I would say some players use it, but some Egyptian players use it better than others. Uh, so Ali, for example, again, he's probably more like the Janshur Khan kind of style, where he's he's using height a lot. But he'll push in the. It's just an all-court game, so it's a combination of of uh, you know a few of these different styles. But 
that he used the, the you know he'll use the boast a lot a lot of the egyptian style is to use the boast it's basically to play an all-core game and then to use speeds and counter attack so that so well jonathan did have that he didn't really use the boast very much and and uh you know and he was you know he was one of the uh, my boast was very good and i like playing that style and i just he would just eat up the boast it was just very frustrating <laughs> Uh, but I don't think he's he he influenced that style. No, uh, I mean I think in terms of when you look at I mean every uh, every one of the the top Egyptian players is a slightly different style. Um, sure, Baggy's probably more that high pressure attack. Uh, he's probably gotten a little bit more. Probably you starting to use height and vary in the pace a little bit more now than he used to. But everything used to be you know very very quick and then hammering the ball into the neck, hammering the ball into where he wants the ball to go. Uh, so while well, he would use the boast, it, again, it was a it was a very fast boast, and then he was being very aggressive, uh, you know, with pace from the from his counter attack at that point. Uh, so people use it in different ways, um, but it's uh, no, I don't. A good question, Matt, but I don't I don't think so is, is the answer. Okay, thank you, Martin. I think uh, in an interest of time, as we're getting close to the one o'clock hour, we're going to uh, uh, wrap this up. As I, as I say to everybody that attends our webinars, uh, our uh, presenters are always open to questions and uh, they, will, uh, they will certainly be happy to uh, answer questions if you send them an email. Uh, Martin is our high performance director and so his information is accessible on our uh, website. Um, just a couple of quick wrap up items. Uh, just in an effort to not sure I've missed anybody from an attendance standpoint, and there's two people that did call in. Uh, again, I'm looking if uh, if George Dicker, Victor Berg, Ben Uliana, Dave Sutherland, Dave Hubley, Spider Jones, or Thomas Brinkman, if any of you called in, uh, can you just please unmute your microphone and let me know? Otherwise, uh, I thank you all for attending today's webinar. Just a quick reminder, we still have a couple more webinars uh, in this uh, kind of spring uh, series that we've been working on. Uh, next week, Thursday, April 30th at noon, uh, Dave Howard, a member of our uh, officiating committee, is doing Understanding Officiating for Coaches. We have lots of space in that one. And then uh, Martin does uh, Developing High Performance Habits on Wednesday, May 20th at noon. So if you haven't signed up for either of those yet, I encourage you to do so. And uh, uh, we look forward to having you attend them. Otherwise, thank you all uh, for attending and have a great day. Cheers.